Hello guys and welcome back. So, last lesson we talked about how life changed in Germany for the Jews that lived there. Before 1938, many Jews found that lots of the rights we normally take for granted um, had been taken away from them. For example, they could no longer work in the army, be a teacher, a doctor, a lawyer. However, up until 1938, there really was a minimal threat to their livelihood and their safety. You know, their day-to-day -day safety. There wasn't that overhanging fear that, that comes about a bit later on that they might be arrested, they might be murdered, they might be targeted for violence, okay? So we, yes, of course we see persecution. Of course we see um, some individuals would have been made to do things like clean the roads and lots of really humiliating things like that. Some individuals might have been hurt, but it wasn't a direct threat on their livelihood. Um, and all this does change in 1938. On the 9th of November in 1938, an incident known as Kristallnacht occurred. Now, we often also call this the Night of Broken Glass, and that might give you an indication of what actually happens. This was an awful night of violence and terror against the Jewish community. And I'm gonna go through this in parts, starting with the causes, so we're really, really clear of what happened. Okay, so in terms of causes, now we already know that anti-Semitism existed in Germany and that there was a desire from Hitler to label the Jews as a scapegoat. Um, we talked about that last lesson, so we know what a scapegoat is and we know why Hitler and the Nazi party wanted to do that. This meant that there was anti-Semitism that was escalating and increasing as Hitler came to power in 1934. OK, so he used the propaganda images that we spoke about. He used the school curriculum and he began to change the rhetoric of Jewish danger and Jewish evil in society. Now, rhetoric means is, is a sophisticated word for meaning kind of the message. So he began to change the message around the Jews, around the Jewish presence in society. He made people begin to see them as evil, as a danger. Now, we might call those the underlying long-term causes, okay? However, we do have a trigger that really pushes Kristallnacht into happening. Now, think back to when we looked at the causes of World War I, we discussed the idea of the trigger cause. World War I, it's the assassination of Franz Ferdinand, that last moment where the trigger, if I can do a gun properly, there we go, the trigger on the gun is pulled, okay? And we call that the trigger cause. Now, in this incident, again, we have a trigger cause, and that trigger cause is something that the Nazis see and the Nazis vocalize as being justified or making this event justified, okay? And I'm going to tell you what that trigger cause is now. <clears throat> okay, so a young Jew, and I've got a picture of him here, named Herschel Grinzepan, had been living in France for several years. At this time, he was 17 years old. So here he is, and he's 17. He learned that the Nazis had exiled his parents to Poland. Um, they used to live in Hanover in Germany, but what the Nazis had done is expel from the country, we learned that word last lesson, expel, get rid of, all the Jews who weren't ethnically German, okay? So if you were not ethnically German, so fully, completely German by your birthright by your passport and you were Jewish and you lived in Germany, doesn't matter how long you lived there for, you had to go, okay? And Herschel's family were ethnically Polish. So even though they'd lived in Germany for a very, very long time, um, they were forced to leave. Now, not only were they forced to leave, they were expelled from Germany, but the Polish government didn't recognize their entry or their right to be in Poland. So his parents found themselves in a refugee camp, okay? So not a very nice place to live, very, very difficult conditions. You've been forced to leave your home where you've lived for, the, for a very long time, decades, and you know, you have nothing. You're living on, the, on a border um, in a refugee camp. So as expected, he's very angry about that. He's also a teenager, he's 17 years old. He doesn't really think through a logical reaction um, to what's happening. And in anger and in retaliation, on November the 7th of 1938, Herschel shoots this man who is a German diplomat. 
Now, this man's name is Ernst von Rath, um, and he is shot by Herschel um, as for being a German diplomat, the German representative <coughs> in Paris for Germany's government. Rath dies two days later from his wounds that were caused by the gunshot and Hitler, you know, even attends his funeral. So it's clear that Hitler thinks this is a direct attack on the German state. Now you might be thinking, you know, how does one murder or assassination um, cause this entire night of, of horror to unfold? And really it comes down to this man. Now his name is Joseph Goebbels and he's probably one of the most famous Nazis or the most spoken about Nazis after Hitler himself. His role was the Minister for Public Enlightenment and Propaganda. So he basically took care of publicity and the Nazi image. He made sure all the newspapers reflected good, um, positive Nazi stories. He made sure everything they didn't want was taken away. Um, and he helped Hitler to craft the society he wanted through media, um, through censorship, through people's intake of propaganda. I guess a comparison today might be somebody who dealt with, um, you know, the government, all of, all of the government's social media, their image online, their image in the newspapers, um, and that kind of thing. So that's Goebbels' job. And he sees this opportunity of the assassination to rile Hitler's supporters into an anti-Semitic frenzy. So remember that word anti-Semitism is where you're prejudiced and you're hateful towards the Jewish people. And he sees this chance. A young Jewish man has killed a loyal Nazi who was in Paris helping Germany and he's been murdered because of this evil, nasty Jewish man. We can use that opportunity to spread that message and help to get people really, really angry, okay? And that's what Goebbels does with this. Now, it's by complete coincidence that this actually coincided with the anniversary of the Beer Hall Putsch. Now, we often also call that the Munich Putsch. I'm not going to go into detail about what that event was. It happens much earlier in our timeline um, when Hitler's not in power, when Hitler is trying to get into power. If you want to go and have a quick look at what it was, you're very welcome to. But basically, we have the anniversary of this Beer Hall Putsch, and it's being celebrated as kind of the moment where Hitler first had his first move for power. So it's a big moment and a big moment in the party um, for the Nazis, okay? So it's a big celebration. And all of the Nazi party leadership had assembled in Munich for the commemoration of this. So Goebbels used this chance to talk to everyone and encourage this anti-Semitism. Um, he actually asks Hitler if he can make the speech that night. Hitler was supposed to be making a speech. Goebbels says, can I do it? And Hitler's very taken aback by this. You know, it's completely abnormal for anyone other than him to make this speech. But Goebbels comes to the stand after Hitler actually allows it, and he makes this most, you know, the most powerful speech. It really cements his, his role in, in this regime um, and secures his, you know, his life, his future, as one of Hitler's first-hand men, really. But he makes this very persuasive, full of stereotype, you know, very much a, a propaganda speech to all the Nazi party leadership. Um, and he actually blames this event on the whole of world Jewry. So it's not just the fault of one man, of our 17-year-old Herschel. Actually, it's the whole community of Jews all over the world. And they have conspired to commit this assassination against the German state. Okay, so it encouraged an idea that all Jews everywhere were evil and they all threatened the state. His words are taken as a command to unleash a violence, a violence that Germany hasn't seen before. And after his speech, um, the assembled regional party leaders issue instructions to local officers and the violence begins to erupt almost immediately in various parts of the Reich throughout the late evening and early morning hours of November the 9th. At 1.20 a.m. on the 10th of November, Reynard Heydrich, who was the head of the security police, sent an urgent telegram to headquarters. 
of the state police with directives regarding the riots. Now, he said that spontaneous rioters were to take no measures endangering non-Jewish German life or property. So they weren't allowed to harm or potentially harm anyone that wasn't Jewish. They weren't allowed to subject foreigners to violence. Um, they were to remove all synagogue archives prior to vandalizing synagogues and to bring this material to the security service. And they were to arrest as many Jews as local jails could hold, preferably young, healthy men. And what this directive led to was that the SA and the Hitler Youth Units throughout Germany and all of its annexed territories started engaging in the destruction of Jewish homes and businesses. Members wore civilian clothing um, to support this fictional idea that these disturbances were actually expressions of outrage public reaction. You know, it looked like the whole of the community had come out in spontaneous violence. They were so angry about what happened to this German um, diplomat. They were so angry about this conspiracy of the world of Jews against them. But actually, it was mostly the police mostly the Hitler youth groups, people who directly supported Hitler um, dressing in civilian clothing to give this impression. So in terms of the damage the rioters did, they destroyed hundreds of synagogues um, throughout Germany, Austria and Sudetenland, which were all the areas that Germany controlled by now. Many synagogues burned through the night in full view of the public and of local firefighters and firefighters had been instructed they were only allowed to intervene where the fire risks spreading to nearby buildings. So I just want you to think for a moment, you know, if you follow any religion, whatever that religion may be, imagine how you would feel if you watched your religious building, whether it's a church, a mosque, a synagogue, whatever it is, something else. Um, if you saw that burning and nobody did anything to stop it, um, you know, you think about your religious book, whatever that book is and imagine that book burning inside the building all of your relics or paintings or anything that inside of that building that is really special to you and your faith and it burns away and everybody just watches it um 267 synagogues were burnt down on this night the SA and Hitler Youth across the country shattered shop windows of around 7,500 7, Jewish owned shops and looted, so stole the wares. So again, imagine you own a business or think about if your parents own a small business, a shop or whatever it is, and people just destroyed it and stole everything um, for absolutely no, no reason at all other than the fact that you were Jewish. Even Jewish cemeteries were destroyed. Lots of the gravestones were desecrated, which is a word we would use to say, to mean kind of, you know, vandalized or had graffiti tags put on them, um, writing over the top of them, things like that, broken, the stones broken or taken away. Um, imagine your relatives and if that had been your family. Berlin and Vienna were home to the two largest Jewish communities and mobs of SA men roamed the streets, attacking Jews in their houses, forcing Jews they encountered to perform acts of public humiliation. Um, you know, when I say humiliation, I mean things like forcing adult men to, to, to clean the streets. Um, sometimes people who follow the Jewish religion might have beards or might have um, some long hair and often they were made to cut those off and you know they have a symbolic place in faith for, for these men and that's really highly humiliating and and really painful to do um murder wasn't in the central directives but many lives were claimed and official figures sit at 91 however recent scholarship believes that actually there were hundreds of deaths that haven't been recorded and we don't really know about. In addition, as the pogrom, which is a word we often use to describe when Jewish communities are attacked. So as the pogrom spreads, SS policemen arrested up to 30,000 Jewish men and transferred them to local prisons. And then they were taken to concentration camps in Dachau and Buchenwald. So this was really the first moment where this happened with the concentration camp system. So the last thing I want to talk about is kind of why this was significant. 
So it marked the first instance in which the Nazi regime incarcerated, so imprisoned Jews on a mass scale simply because of who they are or who they were, you know, their ethnicity, their faith. Hundreds died in these camps, and I've got a picture of one of them behind me. This is Dachau behind me. Um, you know, we're not, we haven't done our lesson on concentration camps yet. That's coming next week. But when we do it, and even just from looking at the picture, you know, it's a, it's a really horrible place to be. Um, brutal treatment, not very nice conditions. So hundreds ended up dying in these camps after they were taken away on Kristallnacht. And it, it also spurred emigration of Jews from Germany in the months to come. So this night of violence showed lots of families and individuals that actually it wasn't safe anymore to stay where they were. And they started that process of emigration out of Germany. In the immediate aftermath of the pogrom, many German leaders like Hermann Göring criticized the extensive material loss produced. So they're not criticizing the brutal treatment, murder, burning, humiliation of a group of people. They're criticizing the loss of money, um, you know, the burning down of buildings that, that have lots of things in there that is worth money, which the German government could have used. So. To, to try to rectify this, they actually impose a fine on the Jewish community after they have to accept all the blame of this night. So the Jewish community have not only endured this awful night of violence and horror, um, businesses destroyed, synagogues burnt, men, fathers, brothers, sons taken away, maybe never to return, but they then have to take the blame of this and admit it's our fault. And not only that, but they then have to pay 1 billion Reichsmarks, which is 400 million US dollars, to the German government to make up for the damage, a damage that was done to them. Um, the Reich government then also confiscates all insurance payouts to Jews whose businesses and homes were looted or destroyed, leaving these homeowners and these business owners personally responsible for the cost of all the repairs. So, I mean, it's just, it's just awful, isn't it? It's entirely almost impossible to come back from this financially, but let alone, you know, the other side of things, the threat to livelihood, the threat to life itself. After Kristallnacht, the German government created lots of laws and decrees designed to deprive the Jews of their property and their means of livelihood. Jewish owned businesses were taken away often at a fraction of the cost. Um, and given or sold to, to, to German people. Legislation also now began to remove Jews from public life entirely. So Jewish children were expelled from schools, German Jews lost the right to hold a driver's license or even own a car, um, and they could no longer go to theatres, cinemas, concert halls. So this night really is the moment where everything starts to change. And up to 1938, yes, it was difficult. Yes, it wasn't a nice experience. Yes, there was um, anti-Semitism and discrimination, but actually you could still just about go about life in a normal-ish type of way. After 1938, it became incredibly difficult to exist within this German state. Lots and lots of leg legislation completely debilitated normal life and took away lots of the pleasures and the nice things about normal life and on top of all of that we see this very real threat to Jewish existence begin um, and this really is what we would call a turning point in the treatment of Jews in Nazi Germany.